Anybody? Okay, we're all in here. Okay, uh, first I want to welcome you. Uh, this is uh, New England Hymns. It's a, a social. Uh, up in the Boston area, we do these monthly. Uh, and we're trying to expand our reach into Vermont and Connecticut and Rhode Island. Uh, and this is our first event in C Connecticut in, I don't know, five, six, seven years. And uh, it looks like a great program. And I want to first have the board members of New England Hymns stand up because they're the ones that have put some of the funding in this. And I want to thank them for that. And uh, again, we do these programs and we're gonna to try to do more. Uh, and I'd like to talk to some of you later just to see if, if any of us in this area have other events or topics that we wanna talk about uh, and have more activities down here. Uh, the next person I wanna introduce is uh, Susanna Feminella. Uh, she's the managing director of K-Force, and she has promised to keep it really short because HIMSS does not allow a lot of uh, advertisement, but again, uh, they funded a good portion of tonight's event, and I wanna thank you uh, for doing that, and just you know, have you talk for a couple minutes, thanks. It's nice to see some familiar faces out there. Um, I don't want to advertise. I want to just say thank you to everybody that has come. I think this is a great event, um, a great learning opportunity. Um, thank you to the speakers for what you're going to be presenting tonight. Our goal out of sponsoring this event tonight was to make sure that everyone who did attend was able to leave with more knowledge so you'll be able to better do your jobs when you get back to work tomorrow and for the next quarter and the next few years as well. So we hope that the... Uh, the information that we hear tonight is useful to you. And again, thank you for those, particularly those that have come from further afield. Um, up in Massachusetts, I've spoken to a bunch of you that have driven down today, so safe drive back as well. Beyond that, enjoy your evening. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, the next person is Steve Burroughs. Uh, Steve Burroughs uh, runs the program, put together the program uh, for the management science health information technology program uh, at Sacred Heart University. It's the first one in the state, I believe, of that ilk. And uh, he had an advisory board that I was on. I was on the board with, with Lisa, so that's how we got this, this going uh, on, the, on the topic area. And I'll let him talk for a bit on his program. And again, uh, Sacred Heart University also helped sponsor this. Thank you, Steve. Well, good evening, everyone, and I guess I don't have too much to say because Rich covered pretty much the topics here, the top points. Uh, welcome to Sacred Heart University. As Rich had mentioned, I'm the program director for the new graduate program in healthcare information systems. A brand new graduate program here started just this semester and we're we'll launching the entire, the, the core program in January. Um, I sometimes give this talk to folks that don't really understand what HIT is, and I know everyone in the room here really understands the importance of education, so that makes my job a lot easier tonight. But basically, the, it's a typical uh, master's program, 36 credit, um, preparing for people to work in our f growing field. You know, Hospital-based, physician office, um, you know, working them through a graduate program to be um, prepared for what's coming down the pike. Um, I'd like to actually also introduce Dr. Walker. Um, Dr. Patricia Walker is the Dean of the College of Health Professions and really is the brainchild behind this program. She was the one who had the foresight to see that we needed to have professionals trained, educated, and actually started the program in the process to get us here at Sacred Heart. So the thanks really go to her. Um, she handed the baton to me in January, and it's been an interesting um, couple of months learning, um, having come from the healthcare IT field myself, um, what it really means to, to work through a graduate program. So. Thank you all for coming here tonight. I think it'll be a very valuable um, discussion in terms of what we need to learn, what's coming down um, for EPIC and, and some of the implementation. So I, I'm certain that you'll enjoy Lisa's talk this evening. Thank you. And our uh, speaker tonight is Lisa Stump. And as we all know, uh, Yale New Haven Health System is uh, putting in EPIC, as are some other systems in the state and in New England. So I think that's the level of interest. Um, Lisa, you got to look at this crew here, and it, it is quite a turnout for you. So we're expecting good things from you. Uh, no, pressure. no pressure, yeah. <laughs> Lisa is a 1991 graduate of the University of Connecticut School of Pharmacy and a 1993 graduate of the Ohio State University, where she earned a master's degree in hospital pharmacy administration. Uh, she's recognized uh, by the New England, uh, New Haven Business Times in 2003 as a recipient of the under 40 
of the 40 Under 40 Award and completed Six Sigma Leadership Green Belt Training in 2002. She co-authored numerous peer-reviewed publications, and in 2009, she was installed as a fellow of the American Society of Health System Pharmacists. In 2010, she was awarded the College of Health Information Management CHIME CIO Bootcamp Women's Scholarship, and she has held a series of management and leadership positions beginning at Grant Medical Center, Columbus, Ohio, in 1993 and moved to Yale New Haven Hospital in 1996 in the position Clinical Coordinator Drug Use Policy. She served as the Director of Pharmacy Services at Yale New Haven Hospital from 2000 till 2008 when she assumed the position of Administrative Director of Clinical Informatics. Currently, she is the Vice President at Yale New Haven Health Systems, responsible for the implementation of EPIC EMR and revenue cycle applications at the system, uh, and Northeast Medical Group practices, and the Yale Medical Group faculty practices and affiliated community practices. She resides in Southington, Connecticut with her husband and her three children. Lisa, thank you very much, and you have the podium. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here tonight to talk to you about our EPIC implementation. As you can tell from Rich's introduction, uh, I am not an IT expert. Uh, I am a clinician, a hospital pharmacist for most of my career. Um, and I think that's one of the key components uh, that we'll emphasize as we talk a little bit about our implementation. Um, this really has been led by our end users, most uh, being clinicians, with strong support from our, our technical um, colleagues. And uh, our chief technology officer, Ed Fisher, uh, from Yale New Haven Health is here with me. Uh, I refer to him as my evil twin. Um, and so if any of your questions get too far afield into the technical arena, uh, I'll actually rely on Ed uh, to help me out. But I thought we would spend some time uh, tonight talking about um, our EPIC implementation. I have to remember how to make the remote work. Oh, I remember. Aha. All right. First test. We can get the remote to work. Okay. So um, we'll spend some time uh, talking about uh, why we chose the EPIC system for our health system uh, as the right solution. I'll touch a little bit upon who EPIC is, uh, and that's a little bit about why we chose them, uh, as well as what our overall plan is for implementation. So why EPIC? Uh, and this is a, probably the only joke that I'll deliver. Uh, we actually had uh, colleagues uh, in one aspect of our health system report to us that they wish they could have been live on EPIC already. Uh, because we had to delay a surgical case when a small child uh, was actually found eating part of the paper record uh, and therefore <laughs> violated their NPO status. So <laughs> if we want to prevent that, uh, going to any EMR really, uh, but uh, we thought we'd include that. Um, a little bit about who we are as a health system and the environment that we started from. Um, we are comprised uh, Bridgeport Hospital, Greenwich Hospital, the Yale New Haven Hospital, um, we are implementing EPIC in our Yale Medical Group practices, so the faculty practices of the Yale School of Medicine, uh, as well as the Northeast Medical Group practices that are the community-based uh, primarily practices that are part of our health system. Um, as you can see, uh, we very much believed in a best-of-breed mentality, and though an organized health system had quite a variety of information technology solutions across our health system. So everything from uh, Cerner and Allscripts applications at Bridgeport uh, to Meditech uh, and an OR system called Pisces at Greenwich. Uh, at Yale New Haven alone, we had the Eclipsis Allscripts solution in our inpatient environments. We had GE, we still do, uh, running in our operating rooms. Um, a variety of um, GE applications in ambulatory as well. Um, and as you look at this, and, and we looked at it, we said, gee, that there's got to be a better way to organize our technology infrastructure to support patient care across the continuum. Not to mention the hundreds of other applications across all of our areas uh, providing a variety of functions. And we had multiple instances of the same application across our organizations, and then we had different applications performing the same function uh, in various uh, areas of the organization. 
As you can tell, this gave us a very fragmented and episodic approach uh, to patient care, not what we wanted to offer to our patients, and really felt like we had an opportunity to do this better. Um, the scalability issue, I think, was an interesting one. So um, as a health system, and, and many of us uh, here in the audience, our health systems are growing, right? The, the age of the single small hospital, very much going by the wayside. Um, and as we look to uh, join in our health system or acquire other hospitals, even other practices, that all of this disparate systems makes it very hard to scale up uh, and make these acquisitions simple. So part of the, the reason to go with a large integrated system as well is to address some of that scalability issue. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So we thought we needed a new day, uh, and Epic would really give us that. Um, when we think about Epic, it, it really is a different paradigm. Uh, so a single integrated system for us across all of the clinical arenas as well as the business functions, registra registration, scheduling, and billing. Um, this really is a double-edged sword, the, the way we think about this. So not only are there opportunities because of that to align and streamline areas like regulatory compliance, clinical workflow, quality of care, and the patient experience, it also requires that we change our regulatory compliance, our patient experience, our clinical documentation. Um, and so that's a lot of the hard work. Um, I would tell you, Ed might disagree with me, the technical side of getting Epic in is the easy part. Um, dealing with the organizational alignment, the standardization, the behavior changes has been the much more challenging component. And that's really what I'm going to spend uh, most of the time talking about tonight. So we went from episodic care to Epic. Um, and this is a classic for any of you who have seen presentations from Epic the vendor. Uh, and so I'll also start by saying it's going to sound at points like I work for them and that I sell Epic. I don't. Um, but this is uh, a slide that they often use that Epic really is focused on having the patient at the heart of what they do. Um, they are an employee-owned and independent company in Verona, Wisconsin. These are actually, uh, this is a, a slice of their campus. For any of you who have visited, uh, I, I kind of think it reminds me of Epcot Center um, and Disney. Um, you know, it's got everything from a stairway to heaven uh, to the gateway to hell and uh, tree houses, um, but you, you really do uh, get a different feel. Um, as we signed on with Epic, we really recognized not only was it giving us a new opportunity to do business differently, uh, but we were joining a, a pretty good complement of colleagues across the country. So Epic now, and then these numbers just continue to climb. Uh, they have over 275 customers, uh, large uh, customers across the country, 230,000 physicians using the Epic EMR today. Um, that's 102 to 155 million people that are covered by an Epic electronic medical record. Uh, and you can see the percentages of the US population and of the world. So it, it is pretty impressive. Uh, and just another way to look at that. Um, I actually like this slide, and the red states had nothing to do with the election, so <laughs> wipe that out of your mind. Um, but this was a, a slide that uh, Judy Faulkner, uh, the, the CEO of Epic, presented at a recent user group meeting. The states in red uh, are actually represent those states in which more than 40% of the population is covered by an Epic EMR. And so if you look uh, to New England, and we're up here, um, so Rhode Island's about the only state uh, not yet in that bucket. Uh, Connecticut, with just Yale New Haven Health System at this point, although uh, I know that's growing rapidly, um, you know, already in that complement of states with uh, a large proportion of patients in, in Epic EMR. So for those of you thinking about it, again, you know, that same message, uh, you won't be the first to have gone down this path. Um, just a couple of slides, you can read these, I won't, but uh, the, the clientele that are also using Epic uh, as their solution for an EMR. Again, you can see a wide array of large academic medical centers. Uh, understand Epic does focus um, and choose their clientele among academic medical centers, large health systems, and children's hospitals. So again, a, a small independent hospital, uh, unless they're accessing Epic through one of these larger systems, uh, is not something that uh, Epic would entertain. Just a few more of their clients. 
Um, the epic philosophy is something that's been really important, and um, I know uh, Steve solicited some questions from participants ahead of time, and as I, I glanced at those, and, and we'll go into them, um, this philosophy is, is really one of the hallmarks of what I think sets Epic apart from other vendors that, that we have worked with. Um, they, and, and again, it's that double-edged sword. They are fairly prescriptive in their model, um, and that has benefit. Sometimes that has its challenges. So we struggle sometimes. I see heads nodding. It feels like they're inflexible. Um, they're telling us how to do this, um, and they are. Um, and their experience is often right. And so within reason, I would tell those of you who are considering working with them, you do have to trust the process uh, to some degree. But their model is really based on these four main components. They strongly believe and encourage and incorporate into everything they do that you should learn from others, stand on the shoulders of others. So those 275 other clients that have already implemented Epic, the lessons learned from those sites, even the clinical content and workflow decisions are now embodied in what Epic calls the model system. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, adopting the model system was a key part of our approach uh, at Yale New Haven Health System. Along with that, you know, so don't reinvent the wheel. If the Johns Hopkins and the Dallas Children's already figured out that doing it this way doesn't work and this way is better, Epic will tell you that. Um, you, you'll start to hear, uh, you know, from them, very valuable, you know, that they are very good at bringing you 10% of our clients do it this way, 90% of them do it this way, here are the benefits of doing it this way. Now, you may find yourself much more like the 10%, and that's the way that you should do it, but clearly not to reinvent the wheel. And then certainly, uh, all of us know very well, uh, all of our IT implementations expected to be on time and on budget, uh, and they, they will very much support you in that. So our plan, um, again, to move from all of that episodic care, best of breed, lots of disparate systems that didn't talk to each other, and think about that. So we literally had patients come in through our emergency department, have that portion of their record documented essentially on paper, scanned into a system that folks then felt was electronic because it was digitized, right? Um, that patient might get admitted uh, and go up to the operating room. We had the GE system, if I, if I think about the Yale New Haven example, that portion of their record operating there. Then they go out to the floor, we have an all scripts inpatient EMR, and then they followed up with their surgeon in the office who might have a paper record or be on our GE centricity solution. And while we tried our best to string that all together with interfaces and hotkeys to jump in context from one record to the other, it's pretty disjointed, right? Um, and so this was our vision, to create and adopt Epic as a single electronic clinical and revenue cycle application. And we'll talk a little bit about where that starts to take us in terms of um, business analytics and clinical analytics and decision support as well. So I'll talk now about um, the overall scope of our implementation, some of our guiding principles, and then the general philosophy uh, that we followed. A little bit more about who we are, I think a lot of you know this, um, but we are uh, a compilation of the Yale New Haven Hospital, um, and through uh, recent acquisition of the St. Raphael's Hospital, we now operate the Yale New Haven Hospital on two campuses. So uh, we will implement EPIC on both uh, the York Street campus as well as the St. Raphael campus. We implemented EPIC already at Greenwich Hospital. Uh, that happened back on April 20th, so just about seven months ago. We will implement on the York Street campus of Yale New Haven Hospital on February 1, 64 days from today, but I'm not counting. Um, and then uh, the St. Raphael's campus on June 1st, and then we'll do Bridgeport Hospital on September 20th. Uh, and then we've got a couple of other um, large group practices coming at the tail end of the project as well. Uh, and just some of the metrics about our health system. Um, let me mention again, um, Community Connect is uh, the program through which we offer EPIC to independent community physicians uh, who want to take advantage of, uh, again, the continuity of a single integrated record with the hospital that they primarily affiliate with, uh, one of our system hospitals, also allows them to take advantage of the meaningful use incentives. Um, and so we are able to offer through contract and under uh, paid contract uh, to those independent practices the opportunity to use EPIC in their, in their practice. Um, we've got, let me think, we have about 
89 practices uh, in the community now live uh, on our EPIC EMR. And then as well on the ambulatory front, uh, we are implementing EPIC in our Northeast Medical Group practices and then the faculty practices uh, at the Yale Medical Group. Um, our EPIC implementation, and I apologize, the, the colors aren't uh, great there, but um, we are implementing essentially all of the EPIC clinical applications except for the laboratory application, I would tell you, uh, which is known as Beaker. So everything from core EPIC inpatient clinical documentation, um, again, this includes front door to uh, back end. So all of the registration, scheduling, billing, as well as some of the specialty clinical modules. Uh, I know one of the questions that came in was about those specialty areas. Um, we as well are implementing the oncology specialty application, uh, the Phoenix uh, solid organ transplant application, both cardiant and radiant, so interventional cardiology, as well as the radiology application, so it replaces the former um, RIS system. Um, and then one of the very nice features um, is what Epic calls MyChart. Uh, and this is essentially a, a readily available patient portal. So MyChart enables patients to, um, upon the engagement with their primary care provider, uh, who chooses to enroll them in the application, allows the patient to interact with portions of their own medical record and to interact with the provider. So through secure messaging, they can email the provider. They can also make appointment requests, or if the provider chooses, actually schedule appointments in open blocks of time. We find most providers choose the request functionality. Um, it's one area I would tell you, and we now have almost 6,000 patients um, using the MyChart application. We're, we're okay with that number. Uh, I think we'll, we'll see it continue to rise um, as we continue to implement, particularly in the larger hospitals. And then um, our implementation also includes uh, CPMRC is a third-party vendor uh, that provides standard content for interdisciplinary care planning. And so we chose, rather than to build our own care planning content, to, to um, incorporate the CPMRC content. And EPIC will allow you easily to do that with Zincs or CPMRC. So it's one of the early decisions um, that, that the organization will make. Um, in addition to the core EPIC applications, and I mentioned CPMRC, again, this implementation really gave us an opportunity when we looked at those hundreds of different applications uh, to standardize where we could many of those ancillary third parties as well and to bring forward some key safety um, and efficiency functionality. So in addition to the single integrated record, along with EPIC, we will implement bedside uh, medication barcode verification, which um, we had implemented at Greenwich Hospital, uh, portions at Bridgeport Hospital, we had not yet implemented at Yale New Haven Hospital. That is now part of the standard implementation as we roll forward. Um, interdisciplinary care planning, as I mentioned in CPMRC, um, we also chose at this point to um, standardize and integrate the fetal monitoring system. So again, part of our, as we roll forward through the hospitals, part of the implementation includes implementation of OBICs uh, for fetal monitoring. Um, biomedical device integration, uh, we chose the um, capsule technology. Um, so that in our critical care environments, at least, um, vital sign data is flowing directly from the bedside monitors into the EPIC EMR for verification. Um, as I'm sure you can imagine, that's a huge time saver for our clinical nurses. Um, E-prescribing, um, probably not anything you consider new and, and exciting, but believe it or not, not in uh, consistent use across our organizations and now part of the standard implementation as we roll forward. Single standardized electronic discharge instructions through exit care. Uh, we chose MDON as our vendor for real-time eligibility checking. Again, that's a standard part of uh, the business side of the installations. Um, and then a single scanned image and document management solution. So while EPIC has native scanning functionality, um, it really is positioned well for only the small volume, but large volume scanning, uh, we still needed to rely on uh, a separate vendor and we're using the McKesson HPF solution right now. Okay. So that's a little bit about what we're installing. Um, it was really important for us um, 
again, a lot of our implementation, as I said, much more about how we were choosing to come together in this than the actual solutions. Um, if you think about where I told you we started from with different EMRs at, across all of our organizations, we knew we needed to do that differently, come together on a single platform. Epic not only gave us a really solid technical solution, a single integrated solution for all of the clinicals and all of the financials, for us as well, it was a, a neutral platform uh, for the organizations to come together in. But we adopted these key guiding principles. First and foremost, this was about our patients and the patient experience. So we, we wanted to eliminate the, that disjointed episodic care. And you all know, you, you go to the, the doctor for yourself or a loved one, your child, they ask you over and over, what are you allergic to? How many surgeries have you had? Patients get really frustrated and they start to think, why don't you know yet that I'm allergic to penicillin? <laughs> I've been to your hospital 50 times in the last year. And so um, this really is all about putting the patients first, what makes sense for the clinical workflow, not necessarily for uh, us as healthcare workers. We agreed right up front that we are all accountable for the success of this. And you'll hear uh, Epic very much uh, espouses this, this mentality. This is not an IT project, they'll tell you. Now, it clearly is an IT project, but far more about clinical end users determining how to build the system. And so right up front, we said everyone is accountable for this. And we still see it. There's groups that it's very easy to sit back and throw grenades at the process sometimes. My philosophy is to bring those people in if you bring a problem, you need to be part of the solution, and that's really a key component uh, of the methodology that we've adopted. The last two, I think, are, are really at the core of the methodology. We said we would standardize not only content, but workflow within Epic, so that includes everything from physician templates for their notes to the content of order sets, um, and then the, the workflows that go with that. Um, and we chose to use what Epic calls the model system. So again, through their experience now, 275 large implementations, um, they really have compiled what they think are the best practices and assembled that into what they call the model system. So you can choose to take Epic as the plain building blocks. Many organizations choose the model system. I would tell you it does enable that speed to value. Um, it's not uh, the be all end all, it's a great starting point. Uh, I think many in our organization still expected the model system to solve all our problems. Um, you know, why do we need 160 analysts? You have the model system, Lisa. Okay, M model is just the start. Uh, and so, you know, for, for those of you thinking about perhaps building teams, uh, I would tell you to think about that carefully. Um, in terms of the implementation process, uh, this is actually uh, a slide I adopted from Epic themselves. Um, the, the main key components and steps as we go through the various phases of implementation. So um, phase zero, again, all about the initial education and planning and really education of the organization. You really have to be able to buy into the fact that you will accept Epic's advice, you will accept the process, you will believe that other smart people across the country have contributed to the model system and that you're not as different as you think uh, in your organization. And we all tend to think that we are. Um, we then move through analysis and design, uh, collaborative build and validation, system build and end user adoption, testing and training, certainly go live and optimization, uh, and then continued optimization and rollout. And I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like uh, for us. This is Epic's model. They will tell you to go fast. Um, it often feels like it's too fast. Um, some of the things that you'll hear, you know, we often wait for, well, there's not a perfect solution, right? We don't have the perfect way to move a patient from the ED triage area into the room. Therefore, we should wait three more months to figure out the perfect solution. The philosophy really is that, you know, uh, perfect is the enemy of good enough and that good enough has to be what you do and that we need to go fast. So our specific journey uh, and, and timeline started this way. We signed our EPIC contract in July of 2010. We began building the team. Uh, Ed Fisher and I actually were part of a five-member interim leadership team who had the fortune of being told we had to build a team of at least 100 people 
um, and get them on a plane on October 18th. Uh, and we were able to start that work in late August. Um, we managed to do that, uh, assembled the team, got them off to training, and were then able to start uh, what we call the collaborative build sessions, uh, which ran January through April of 2011. The collaborative build sessions I'll spend a little bit of time on um, were an interesting process. So this was really about you take that model system um, and you show it to rooms of end users. So I can tell you we had a room probably this large at the Trumbull Marriott uh, near our project headquarters. We had um, more than 1,500 people across our organizations participate in the collaborative build process and a very formal, structured voting process. Each individual actually received a red and a green card. And as we presented a decision, uh, for example, will we just list the patient allergy or will we also list their reaction to the allergy? Every member in the room raised their red or green card on whether they agreed that we were going to list both. Um, the red cards all got addressed through questions. Why are you concerned, sir, about listing both? We would hear it. The room debated themselves, uh, and we would get to an ultimate decision um, to where we finally got everyone green or the reds agreed. They were outnumbered, uh, and we would mitigate whatever those concerns were. It's a, it's a fun process. Um, we then, uh, the team then sort of regroups, uh, takes all of those collaborative build decisions and does the actual build. Um, we chose, uh, again, that all of our certified, all of our analysts would be certified uh, by EPIC. So that is the multiple trips to Verona, Wisconsin. Um, they actually are tested uh, and complete projects that are signed off by EPIC, uh, and we, we maintain that as our standard. So all of our builders uh, are certified builders. We launched our first ambulatory implementation on October 19th of 2011 um, and la launched MyChart uh, concurrently with that implementation. Um, we then did our first ambulatory practice management site live. So as we were implementing in the Yale Medical Group, um, they, prior to implementing EPIC, uh, operated a paper electronic medical record but used GEIDX for all of their uh, practice management solutions. Um, we have continued the, to let them um, operate under GE for practice management, but have implemented the EPIC EMR. We then did our first ambulatory practice management site uh, go live in November of 2011, um, and that was one of our Northeast Medical Group practices that we did a big bang on both practice management and clinical EMR. So we'll talk a little bit about that. In the ambulatory arena, we, we've done every combination of possibilities. So we did EMR only, we did Big Bang EMR practice management, and we've done some that went practice management first in a Big Bang, so we brought all practices live on practice management and then slowly phased in the EMR. I would tell you no one solution is better than another. It really is dependent upon what's going on in that individual uh, practice, um, and, and that really drove our decision around that. Um, and, and this was a good example. So in the Northeast Medical Group, uh, last February, we did a big bang, brought all of those practices live on the practice management solution. As I said, our first hospital go live at Greenwich in April, um, and then uh, we'll continue to go forward through the upcoming implementations. Um, this is how it plays out uh, for those of you who are more visual uh, than in lists. Um, and you can see, again, it is a, a fairly packed uh, timeline of events um, that have gotten us up to where we are. Um, I should mention, in the middle of the implementations, uh, we will actually do a major upgrade to the EPIC applications uh, coming up on December 8th. So um, we, <laughs> we have brought um, all of the sites to date have come live on the EPIC 2010 version. We will upgrade to the 2012 or Denali version on December 8th, just prior to the big go live at Yale New Haven. Anybody think we're crazy? <laughs> yeah. So you might be saying, well, what are you thinking? Why would you do that? Um, there was critical functionality in that upgrade that really supports the clinical research workflow that we really felt we could not go live at Yale New Haven and um, with the, the School of Medicine environment and the volume of research that we do without having uh, that functionality. And so uh, we will do that upgrade coming up real soon. 
Um, I don't expect you to read this, but um, the rest of the project timeline as it progresses out uh, through the end of 2013. Just to emphasize again, um, as you start to get through this process, the, the ability to overlap the various stages of implementation. So one hospital, we are very close to going live. So actually next week we will do our 30-day go-live readiness assessment for Yale New Haven Hospital concurrent with the 150-day go-live readiness assessment for the St. Raphael's campus of Yale New Haven Hospital. So as many of the building blocks have fallen into place, uh, it allows us to start to move more quickly. Um, it was very smart for us to bring our small hospital live first. So Greenwich Hospital at 180 beds um, allowed us to, in a smaller environment, bring live what is really probably 80% of the clinical functionality in the hospital environment um, and get that in the hands of live users. So while the collaborative build process is great for engagement, so you think about 1,500 people coming, the ability to say they had a vote in, in what the ultimate build looked like was very powerful. Uh, but until you actually get your hands on the keyboard and try to take care of patients in the application, it's really hard to make some of those decisions, and we hear that a lot. So bringing it live at Greenwich uh, for us was, was very smart. Our rollout strategy, um, and again, Epic will very much uh, recommend and, and support you in util utilizing a big bang approach. And we, we did that, in some cases, selectively and to our advantage. So all of the hospitals do go live in a big bang approach. So all of the clinicals and all of the revenue cycle, one day, all users. Um, and that has worked very well in the small hospital. Um, you can talk to me in 66 days or so. Um, and we'll let you know how it goes at the big house, but um, we, we do expect that it will go very well. And if you think about that, to not do that requires all of those interim throwaway interfaces, interim workflows. Uh, we really just didn't want to, to take on that, that added burden. So for us, it's been uh, all about the big bang. Um, in, the, in the practice management solution for the applications, um, in the practices, as I said, we very much have modified that approach based on the needs of the practice at the time. So in all of those independent community affiliates, our approach is big bang, unless they've got some really strong need that they wanna keep some third party uh, business solution that they're already using. But as I said, we've done it in every iteration of practice management first, second, or big bang. Um, so we really think um, the approach to date really set us up to successfully accomplish a lot of the goals that that we set out to achieve. Um, but there are some key components that I wanna touch on, um, including the organizational structure of the team and how that fits into an overall governance structure for the project. That's been very important. As I said, most of this is about managing change and really thinking proactively about how to manage that change for the organization is a big part of my job, again, Ed makes the technical part run. Um, my team builds the clinical applications themselves. Most of my time is managing the, the behavior um, and the change. Um, a big part of this for us, um, again, really to optimize our systemness, and we'll, I, I take some liberties with the English language. I think systemness is a word. Um, we'll talk about that, and then really key uh, about engaging physicians. This is uh, a scheme of our table of organization for the project. So our project team, it consists of 160 FTEs, most of them the application analysts, and they are arranged in groups around their individual applications. Remember, Epic is one integrated suite, but you have the Willow pharmacy application and the OpTime operating room and the ASAP emergency department. Each individual application has its complement of certified analysts. We then organized those in buckets that we thought made sense. So most of the inpatient clinical applications report up to a couple of managers and then to a single clinical leader. Likewise, uh, all of the revenue cycle applications, so there is a manager for um, professional billing, a manager for hospital billing, those roll up to a single leader around the revenue cycle. What I like to point out here and again, this isn't about reading the words in the boxes, but where you see blue boxes, those represent our employed team. They are employed by the Yale New Haven Health System. The yellow triangles, 
critically important. Those are the subject matter experts. So we talked before, I'd like to say this is not just an IT project. It is an IT project, but it involves much more than that, and it's those triangles in yellow. So at every level of the project, from the frontline application teams, up through the leadership level, and up to our senior executive oversight groups, there are subject matter experts aligned at every layer. Subject matter experts are physicians, they're nurses. On the non-clinical side, they're the registrars and the finance folks and the accountants, making sure that we're building the application in a way that makes sense to allow them to do their job in a way that meets the goals that we set out for. High quality safety care, to be a provider of choice, to be an employer of choice, and to be fiscally sound. So this is really a key component. Um, as we get up to this level, um, our, our leadership level, again, we made a deliberate choice that the folks at that leadership level um, are actually pretty senior members of our health system. They were vice presidents from various parts of the organization. Again, recognizing that mo most of our challenge was going to be in managing the change, not necessarily in the technology, um, we chose to put some pretty high level folks uh, at this level. Um, that then reports up, um, so I'm in this box here uh, as the EPIC project leader, our chief medical information officer, Dr. Steven Schlossberg. Uh, he and I work very closely together uh, in managing uh, many of the decisions and certainly in the physician relationships. And then we report up through our uh, chief information officer. Our executive sponsor is actually uh, Mr. Jim Staten, who is the chief financial officer of the health system. And then we've got oversight uh, from um, our EPIC steering committee, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So this is a breakout um, of the governance structure. At the highest level, really creating that vision, again, that we would become more of a system, create better continuity of care, and undertake a huge change. Uh, that's really being directed at this highest level by the chief executives from all of our organizations, from the Health System Corporation, each of the hospitals, the School of Medicine, and our Northeast Medical Group. Right below that is our EPIC cabinet, and this is really our working group. This group meets every two weeks um, with agenda really set and driven by me and, and my project leads. Uh, this is the group that really is in the day-to-day when we can't get Hospital A and Hospital B to agree to do something the same way, this group needs to get in the middle of that uh, and help us determine what direction we will take. Um, so these are the chief medical, nursing, operating, and financial officers, again, from each of the organizations that we talked about. And then a whole slew, I've just picked out a few, um, of advisory councils and groups. So there is a physician advisory group, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. We have a nursing advisory council, a pharmacy advisory council, and then we have some interdisciplinary groups as well that really are in the trenches um, coming together to use the same record together in the same way. And this is a lot about end users managing each other's behavior. So. When Dr. Kubica doesn't fill out his problem list when he sees the patient on Tuesday and that patient lands in my emergency department today, people get upset that the problem list is not filled out or more often that there's junk in the problem list. Um, and so those are the, the issues that groups like our physician advisory group really come together to set common standards for use of the EMR. As, as we undertook this, um, we, we really had to make some decisions about how to adopt EPIC. And, and you've heard me talk about the need for change management. Um, and I like to point this out. We, we really knew we had some decisions to make. And when you think about that decision against a framework of change management, again, we, we had some options that to us ended up pretty clear. We could simply have installed EPIC in the way that we had done other systems with the Yale New Haven Hospital version, the Bridgeport Hospital flavor, the Greenwich Hospital version. We could simply have installed it, done no change management, but what we would likely expect is a pretty big drop in productivity that we might never recover from. Now, as a health system, we're spending $300 million on this EPIC implementation. To do all of that and be less productive really didn't make a whole lot of sense. We said, okay, we could align some policies 
right? The ones that are really critical to make Epic work, let's just focus on those. Even then, we would only end up back at baseline. And still, for all that effort and all that money to end up back at baseline didn't make sense. We said, look, we need really at proactive change management. And we agreed we would align not just a few policies, but really align work processes. And I keep talking about across our different hospitals, but many of you know in the large hospitals, one patient care unit to the next does things differently. Sometimes on the same unit, day shift and night shift do it differently. Um, we really agreed we needed to be proactive and align all of that. And that's not easy. Um, you know, when you think about, we started this project back in 2010. We made collaborative build decisions now 18 months ago. Stuff's been going on in between, right? And you just think about the Joint Commission comes through and says, you should do X this way. Or more fun, in the state of Connecticut, the Department of Public Health comes through and says, you really need to document skin this way. Well, we built it a different way. And so your organizations are going one way, you're off building Epic in a different way. Keeping those two processes aligned has been a big challenge, it takes a lot of effort, and again, that's all of those advisory groups that we talked about. So the fun of that, um, and one of the approaches that we took, uh, again, tight engagement with our end users, um, and frequent site visits uh, to do a gap analysis. And so this is really a detailed review of the current state, uh, we did this at the onset of the project and then again through the various advisory groups to keep us up to speed on what changes are going on in the organizations. And very clearly, you know, our end users think, well, you're coming to do a site visit so we can tell you how to go change your Epic build. No. We're coming to do a site visit so we can tell you how to manage the change, the difference between your current state and the standards that we've now agreed to and that we're building in Epic. So it really is a lot about the adoption and adaptation. Lots of policy issues though. Um, and if you think about, again, different organizations operating fairly autonomously, we got everyone to agree to that common standard. We all patted ourselves on the back, that's great. Well, every one of those new common decisions meant at least one of the organizations had to go change their policies and procedures and educate everyone about that. Which changes could they adopt ahead of the EPIC implementation? Which did we have to require? Or which could you simply not do until you had EPIC in place? And so a lot of that change management and work going on in between. And it really is a, a yin and yang. And, and folks don't want to think about that. They're like, well, we, we told you what to build on the screen. Why are you worried about the work that goes on around it? But it does all come together, and you really need folks focused on the entire workflow and work process as we go through this. So workflow analysis is a really key component. Um, I would tell you critical in the ambulatory environment. So every practice that we go into, they function differently. And it's you know the doctor's wife that runs the front desk, and she does scheduling and billing. Um, the practice right next door, they've got someone else doing billing and someone else just doing scheduling, and unless you look at all that workflow, uh, the bill just doesn't come together. We've had a lot of success, but I, I would tell you still under construction in terms of really getting to uh, a full state of standardization. And we don't want to standardize just for the sake of standardizing, but some of what we were able to accomplish um, and that we needed to accomplish uh, is some common infrastructure to both guide the build and then sustain those. Uh, so everything from uh, a single medical records committee that didn't exist before and exists now, um, we now have um, with three CNOs at each institution, they come together as a CNO council and drive decisions around nursing practice that we then incorporate into the EPIC build. We standardized the formulary. Uh, so prior to this, we had three different drug formularies at the three hospitals. We've now brought that together into one formulary. Again, simplifies uh, the EPIC build. Uh, and you can see uh, lots of other um, areas that we were able to standardize. So th the EPIC implementation does become a huge lever in allowing you to standardize where you've got uh, all this variation across the organizations. As you can imagine, uh, physician involvement, really critical. And so we really needed to think about how to structure the involvement of our physicians um, to really build a foundation for that ongoing comprehensive approach. 
and it really was uh, and is for us about clinical transformation. So what role do physicians play as we move through this? Um, it starts with initial participation in the collaborative build sessions. So again, our 1,500 or so individuals, um, many of them physicians as we moved through uh, that decision process. And then in an ongoing way, they function as subject matter experts for us. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we've organized them. Um, they also are part of our discussions and implementation of policies uh, to improve the success of the project. So I talked a little bit about this. They, they really had to come together and come up with guidelines for clinical documentation. Um, what, what is, you'll hear it called chart etiquette, right? And we want to avoid note bloat. So one of the side effects of an electronic medical record is suddenly what people used to write as three sentences becomes five or six pages of every lab test that's been run in the patient's 10-day clinical stay. And so um, we really needed them to come together and help us create those guidelines. And of course, they participate in the planning of implementation. Um, and again, for us uh, in the academic environment, a big key uh, in the link to clinical research. I should mention, uh, at the same time, and in parallel to our EPIC implementation, we are also implementing a clinical trial management system uh, called Encore. And so that's another key component uh, that we are integrating as well. Our physician advisory group, or the PAG, uh, is a very formal group. This is a group of physicians who meet very regularly together and then with our project team. Um, and it really is all about us getting the voice of the physician and a clinical vision of a unified record. They deal with everything globally from the structure of our order sets and the clinical documentation. I mentioned some of these, how to manage a problem list. Um, and they are really uh, taking a leadership role throughout the project. Really key, these are practicing physicians. So these are not the administrator types who now wear ties instead of white coats. Uh, these truly are practicing physicians that participate in our, in our PAG. And we did make sure that we had representation across organizations and across clinical specialties to make sure um, that, that we had broad coverage. And their role really does evolve as the project evolves. So again, they start very early in those general discussions. As we've now got more and more live sites, they really are the group keeping each other in check uh, and making sure that good behavior is, um, is conducted. I'll talk a little bit now about uh, some of the, the senior groups um, in a minute. As I said, we've got both ambulatory and hospital physicians, um, the geographic diversity and clinical specialties. Uh, again, it's both ambulatory and hospital physicians uh, across that array. I want to talk a little bit about these leadership roles. Um, so in addition to our chief medical information officer, we recognize the need to have more formal physician leadership as part of the project. Um, so we do employ physician directors, uh, representatives from each of our organizations that dedicate at least half of their time to the project, paid and compensated uh, as a formal part of their role. And it really is about enterprise-wide project leadership um, and, and getting their peers engaged and again, kind of managing, managing their behavior. Important again, um, the, the physician champions, so in addition to those formal paid giving us half their time, we then have the more informal participation in the form of physician champions. So these are folks who really just want to step up and amongst their peers uh, help us in, in a highly involved way. And they support the physician advisory group. I wanted to spend uh, a little bit of time, so that's sort of the, the overview of why we chose EPIC, what we think it's doing for us. Um, and I think, you know, lots of folks asked, how do you feel about the upcoming implementations? We're in a very good position. I think the methodology um, is solid. The advice from EPIC has been very solid. Uh, technically, I'll knock on wood, uh, EPIC's run uh, incredibly well uh, since the day that uh, we brought it up. Um, but a lot of lessons learned, and as you can see, none of them are really about the technical side. Uh, all of our lessons as well have been around the engagement and adoption. Training and simulation was really important um, and they really are two different things. Um, the, the training related to EPIC, uh, very specific to individual roles and very much workflow focused. 
So, you know, you all know as IT folks, we often get really excited about the points and the clicks, and there's five different ways you can do that same function. And if you click this button, it turns pink, and look, it spins around, and we get all excited. Um, folks really need to just understand the workflow. So don't teach people individual functions, but really teach them how to admit a patient. Um, and for physicians, that's, that's really been critical. On top of that, we did layer form or sim formal simulation. Um, so we have simulation experts and a simulation center. I think uh, others of you do as well. Um, this was really important uh, to help folks, you know, when a patient codes, we don't want the first time the code happens after Epic Go Live to have people fumbling with what to do. And so we use sim simulation in very high risk areas, obstetrics, the emergency department, the operating rooms, code situations, uh, and we're continuing to evolve, evolve that a little bit. Our end users have found this uh, incredibly valuable, so I would strongly encourage it. Revenue integrity. Uh, I'm a clinician, so I tend to focus a lot on the clinical implementation and physician involvement. We are a business, right, and the money needs to come in, and when we rip out the, the um, financial system, uh, there's some risk involved, as you can imagine. Um, the the flow of billing in Epic is quite different uh, than what we had been used to. Uh, and we really needed to focus a lot of time and attention on the revenue integrity process. Uh, we've actually dedicated a revenue integrity team to that process to go out and ensure that end users understand their role in capturing the clinical charges. So charges now generate naturally from the flow of clinical documentation. People really need to understand in their work uh, how, how they're impacting the flow of revenue. End user provisioning um, has just been an area that um, we struggled a little bit with early on. Some of the challenge of all of those different systems um, and different user lists uh, presented challenges for us. The provisioning within Epic is actually fairly complex. Um, and the, the different user profiles uh, has been complex. We underestimated that. Uh, I would tell you going into the Greenwich Hospital implementation, um, and implemented uh, a much more robust process uh, as we're coming forward into the new implementations. Reporting and extracts, uh, an area that took a lot of focus for us. This is another area um, really around change management. So folks are used to, at eight o'clock, the paper comes out of the printer with the report they need today. Um, Epic's got a whole different um, mentality around dashboards um, and the, the reluctance to give up the traditional reporting mechanisms has been uh, a big challenge for us. Um, and so we're putting a lot of attention into that. Um, a lot of work around logistics. Um, as I said, leadership, engagement, and accountability. And then this is a lot of hard work for folks, uh, the team as well as the, the end users that we're supporting. And so lots of attention into communication both ways. Again, a lot of change going out. The organizations aren't stopping. Um, as well as our communication out. And then uh, lots of um, reasons to search for uh, celebration opportunities. And so um, that's my conclusion. Um, I, I really wanted to give you a flavor uh, for the overall approach, uh, philosophy, and what's involved in the implementation. Um, I provided you some contact information here, um, but I really wanted to kind of open up for some dialogue and make sure that, that we're covering what you all want to hear. So I'll start with any questions from the audience, and then I know we received some on paper that uh, I can go into as well. Are there any questions? Yes. Biggest surprise. I think um, I've been I've been probably the most surprised. You know, when we talk about all the good that comes from the big clinical integrated record, um, we tend to think it's inherently accepted as a good thing. What I find more often than not, when we talk about this uh, to the lay public and our patients, their biggest concern is about the security of their record. Um, and so uh, I've actually been playing phone tag uh, with one of our patients from Greenwich Hospital this week who is very nervous and upset. So folks tend to think, well, there's 275 people on Epic. We're on Epic. Everybody in the country can see my medical record. Um, and that's been a pretty common misconception. So 
I would tell you in every forum when we've talked to the lay public, the number one concern is about the security of their record. Um, and I just, I kind of found that uh, a little bit surprising. And I know there's some questions uh, that we received um, from members who couldn't be here tonight. Um, and that, that was one of the questions as well. How does Epic deal with uh, the security of the record? Um, and it is at various levels. Um, you know, it starts with, and this is what we tell our patients, it starts with the access to the application um, and then the access within the application. So the person at the front desk doing scheduling doesn't have access to all of the clinical information of the record. It's the, the user roles uh, and security that happen. And then we are a local instance uh, of Epic, so. Right. Yeah, I would tell you, um, as many of you would probably say that that certainly is evolving. Um, where we have um, particularly large practices already invested in, in EMR, really not the right time, or they don't have interest in, in using Epic with us, uh, we have selectively uh, chosen to send some clinical information to, we call them foreign EMRs, uh, to those foreign EMRs based on the relationship with the provider. I think as the, the thinking continues to evolve around a statewide exchange or broader than that, we, we are certainly interested in uh, exploring that technology. And I don't know, Ed, if you want to comment on actual solutions, but, and you've got a lot of experience on this one, so. Yeah, when we first started looking at this, um, you're absolutely right, it's, we looked at these outside providers, we looked at Epic and said, well, it's its own exchange. Look how big this is. Okay. You know, another cover lives in ours, it's its own exchange. But then we started running into, like Lisa said, the practice was large, and she already installed, and, and uh, e-clinical work and said, there are partners too, how are we going to start doing this? The easy way out was Epic has a way to send pertinent information. But that's not going to be good enough for a little bit of having more and more as well. So we're starting to look at methodologies about increasing how we can create products and things to, uh, to do this. But we're closely watching what's going on in the state with what's going to happen with the EHR and the IHEs here. So there's still more to come. But we've got to start addressing this. The next 18 months, we've had a real solid solution for it. Is the CDA standard part of this Yeah, we're looking at those clinical discharge records, you know, in those formats is what we're using. You know, I should say, uh, within Epic, there is a functionality called Care Everywhere. So um, with other EPIC providers, uh, so if uh, one of our patients from Greenwich Hospital lands at Tampa General, um, the Care Everywhere application fairly easily from within the EPIC application allows you to check other EPIC sites to see if that patient has a record in those other locations. And with permissioning to then exchange that, um, that CDC level data, the, the core clinical data. Yes? Um, no, not, not epic opposition. Um, what I was getting at is uh, I think we've all experienced when one of those regulators comes in and says, gee, we think you need to change the way you document something. The organization expects, and we need to respond to that very quickly. And so, in the legacy environment, changes happen. Well, then, you know, the EPIC team and the EPIC process is off acting on decisions that were made back in our collaborative build process, and you end up with processes that no longer align. Um, and so, just to be very careful about about that. You're welcome. Yes. With all of the applications that consolidated. Mm -hmm. and the Right, so um, we haven't consolidated all of them. Let me, full disclosure, uh, as we start that. We, we even there had to choose sort of 
which, which battles to fight. Um, where we consolidated, uh, we do have a team, um, another one of our uh, executive directors in ITS manages all of the non-EPIC clinical applications and, and then works, he and his team work through that consolidation effort. Um, where it made sense, um, you know, we certainly, um, we didn't want to engage in a huge contract negotiation if we didn't need to, as contracts were naturally expiring, uh, unless the big ones, I would tell you, um, in, in some cases, uh, it was really important clinically to have a consistent workflow. We then said, yeah, we do need to go out and, and renegotiate those contracts. But again, we, we weren't yet able to standardize all of them. Yeah, so uh, we actually didn't do data conversion. Um, we made a decision early on. Um, I took a deep breath there because we get that question a lot. Um, there is a natural tendency for everyone to want to convert the eight or 10 or 12 years you've got in your legacy EMR. For any of you who have done those large data conversions, they often don't go well, uh, and we simply chose not to do that. Um, our philosophy has been to do selective data abstraction uh, from the legacy record, again, whether it's paper or one of our legacy um, electronic medical records, key things like allergies, problem lists, um, medication lists, and, and core demographics, we manually abstract from the legacy record and re-enter into EPIC. We are also maintaining access to the legacy EMRs to the end user from the desktop for a period of two years, and then we'll put them on ice and available, you know, for the regulatory period that we need to maintain it. But we, we chose not to do large scale data conversion. Yes? Um, talk a lot about the amount of effort and amount of cost that went into standardizing processes in order to increase productivity. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll talk first, I guess, uh, from the ambulatory perspective. Um, many of the practices uh, operating under an RVU, uh, relative value unit-based model, um, what we see, so it's a little bit twofold. There's an initial loss in productivity, right? It takes physicians longer to do their work. But because of the more robust clinical documentation, you actually do see a rise in the RVUs that they produce. Um, our model in ambulatory, yeah, sorry. Um, we actually didn't budget uh, the increase in RVUs, no. Um, we actually predicted a loss of productivity um, and created some buffer to protect, protect against the lost productivity, but we did not budget for increased productivity. So what, what I'll tell you we see, so there is a deliberate, um, in the ambulatory environment, when we go in, we tell the providers, we require the providers to reduce their schedule by 50% for the first two weeks of the go live. They come up to 75% in week three and back to 100% by week four. But they will tell you for probably three to six months afterwards, they can get their work done, see the same number of patients per day, but they're working probably two hours more uh, to get that work done. They gotta go home, log in, finish their documentation for the day. Um, by about the three to six months, depending on the practice, um, they're, they're getting back to their, their normal productivity. So then they get their volume back and they're logging a higher RVU uh, value as we go. I, I can't tell you the exact percentage, um, but, but that's been the, the experience. Um, we, we don't increase staffing for physicians, we increase staffing for support of physicians. Um, so unlike the ambulatory environments in the inpatient arena, most of the time we can't um, control our volume, right? Uh, but even where we can, we, we don't deliberately say we're going to reduce elective surgeries. Some surgeons select out, they know it's the go-live period where they can wait, they're kind of choosing not to schedule all of the cases that they need to. Um, but on the inpatient arena, it's much more about staffing up than it is about uh, reducing volume. Not for physicians, though. We, again, we, we increase the physician supports. their MAs, nursing staff, uh, and then our project 
support team uh, during the immediate implementation period. Yes. Yes. So um, we did actually engage with Deloitte Consulting uh, to do some formal assessment. So when we came out of that collaborative build process, um, as I said, every time we agreed to a new standard that was the, the new great thing, we had change that had to happen. Um, Deloitte really helped organize all of that. So we had a little over 100 individual policy issues. Uh, they really helped organize that, that, that fell into eight themes. We charged groups, that Epic Cabinet charged individual groups to address each of those areas. Things like medication safety, uh, nursing handoff, uh, code status. We had different levels of code status across the organizations. Deloitte then facilitated that cross-organizational work to say, you've agreed to do this in Epic. What is your policy and procedure actually going to be? And then how are you gonna get from where you are to that new state? We really tried you know, we try to minimize the amount of change that has to happen with the go live. It's big enough in and of itself. So any of those policy and procedure changes that could be done early, we asked the organizations to do that, uh, and they were able to do that. Um, that was mainly around the, the clinical. Um, revenue cycle, uh, we also do have Deloitte engaged uh, more in helping to conduct the charge testing, um, and some of the post-live monitoring to ensure that we get the, the revenue cycle back on track. Um, I should mention, uh, since the go-live, all of that is going incredibly well. And I always forget to mention, I, I should state, uh, Greenwich Hospital, since going live, uh, did actually achieve meaningful use in their first 90 days of go-live, and we actually got paid uh, from the federal government uh, within a few months of that as well, so it, it does pay off. Yes? Um, not all at once. Okay, yep. <laughs> I guess my question is, boy, that seems like a, a lot of decisions needing to be made uh -huh. at a lot of different people at different levels and even weigh in on things. Absolutely. A lot of different debate and how do you get through that process? How long did it take and how do you make sure that you got the right decision? Yeah, I'm going to kind of step away here. Can everybody hear me if I just talk out here? Um, so uh, making sure we got to the right decisions is probably the hardest part. Um, you know, at any given time, there were probably, the largest group was probably 250. Selecting the subject matter experts, we really did, again, rely on the leadership within the organization. Um, yeah. And those decisions are structured around big buckets. So we said, look, today is the day we're going to make decisions about ED to inpatient, patient flow. And we're going to do that from 8 to 10 a.m. We said, okay, chief nursing officer, chief medical officer, who needs to help us make sure that and then we, we tried where we could to keep consistent groups of subject matter experts. Um, I can tell you we're never really sure we made the right decision until folks start to use it. Um, and then we've had to go back and readdress some of those. Then there's a very formal process where, so it's an interesting phenomenon. When you start to do this, um, and Epic describes it as, it will shine a big spotlight on all the inefficiencies in your organization. <laughs> so, um, many of those issues had to go into what we call re-engineering. So in the course of trying to get the reds and the greens, when the room was split 50-50, and it was interesting, people were like, well, today we do it this way. And I look at my colleague and go, no, they don't. <laughs> you know? I know how we program it. That's not how it works. Um, and we had a lot, all that controversy had to go into a re-engineering session. Um, for the most part, again, I think some of it's the epic advice. You know, there is strong consolation and validity in 80% of those 275 other people are doing it this way. Why do we think we can't or shouldn't? You know, we're not that different. Um, so that that was. Okay. Thank you. I want to just take one more question to our time is up, and uh, I'll let you select the last question. Oh. Uh, I wanted you to elaborate a little bit more about your experience.
experience with the uh, big bang approach. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, probably appreciate the financial uh, benefits of it, but what was the experience you had either with challenges or fallout with that approach? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge is actually in supporting it um, for that Greenwich implementation. So just the 180 bed hospital, and I'll talk a little bit about the LNG in the hospital. Uh, we had a command center 24-7 uh, for two weeks of 100 members of our project team, so around the clock, uh, the certified analysts. Um, we followed a formal you know, incident command uh, process, uh, incident commander in charge of the command center, and then all of the end user support. Um, we strongly utilize and endorse a super user model, um, and the super users come from the organization. So they are the staff nurses, they are those physician champions, they are the manager of central registration. They are the first line of support for the end user. Um, again, the, the model EPIC recommends uh, one super user to every eight clinical end users. We definitely adopted that. In addition to that, we layered technical floor support on top of that, either EPIC Corporation staff or our project team. The, when I talk a little bit about logistics, when we go into the Yale New Haven implementation, uh, we're contracting with 150 contracted floor support just in the inpatient foot environment, 250 uh, to support the ambulatory implementation. So our big bang for Yale New Haven is all of the inpatient beds um, on the York Street campus, so just about a thousand beds. Um, and then we have 31 addresses in the ambulatory environments across three counties, um, I forget how many miles, uh, that we're bringing live uh, on, that, on that single day. So it really is that end user support, and believe it or not, all the logistics that go with it. I've spent more time on arranging parking <laughs> and shuttles <laughs> and food for people um, than the technical decisions. So that, that's probably the most challenging part. But the, the most critical, I will tell you. The first complaint we get is we cut support too soon, we didn't have the right numbers in certain pockets of the hospital, uh, so it really is about the support. Lisa, I want to thank you. That was an excellent. And I just want to comment that this is what hymns is for us to share, even though uh, in the real world our, our systems may, may compete to a level at least in delivering IT systems, HIMSS is here to make sure that we can deliver the best IT systems uh, to our systems. Uh, so I want to thank the HIMSS board uh, for supporting this activity. I want to thank KForce uh, for their assistance, as well as Sacred Heart University. And I wish all of you people a wonderful ride home, and please be safe doing so. Thank you very much.